Thank you all and welcome. It's wonderful to be in an environment with so many educators uh, talking about things that we all share and love. I might just ask those of you in the back to move forward because I'm going to be showing quite a lot of images that might lose some of the impact, and this is about the impact of critical making. So please feel free to come forward if you uh, would like. Anyway, I'm here to talk today, as I said, about the impact of critical making. And as mentioned, I have a lot of roles that connect to this subject. One is as the president of Rhode Island School of Design, which is a 138-year-old art and design college. Also, I was formerly the provost and before that, a department head and faculty member. So I've been deeply ingrained in education from my professional life. Additionally, I have a practice outside of uh, education which is not so active now that I'm president, but working on designing and building furniture at different scales from one-of-a-kind objects to production objects. And so I've been deeply immersed in my entire professional life in this notion of making. So we can start the images. So what exactly do we mean by critical making? Critical making is the intersection of critical thinking with rigorous making processes where skills and theory and context and imagination all co-inform and coexist. And there are different aspects of critical making, and I'm going to go through a number of them, talking about how the impact exists at different scales and at different stages. So the first stage that I like to talk about is making as cognitive development, building our intelligence. And in some cases, one would say multiple intelligences. And there's a lot of research being done on childhood development and how we learn and grow and how what we learn and the way we learn it helps us to exist in the world in different ways. But there's still a lot of confusion and difference of opinion about what actually makes an impact on cognitive development. And as we grow, as the mind grows, there are these different threads that um, people point to that help us to develop as human beings. And interesting, that base of knowledge of what actually causes cognitive development is also always in cognitive development. I think, you know, everyone in my generation of child rearing was looking for the baby Einstein, you know, thinking about the next genius and how one would educate that child and to become the next star thinker, inventor. But there is growing research that shows that children really need to learn by engaging in their physical environment and by manipulating all of their senses and working their parts of their body together in cohesion. And there are some theories that even say that children under the age of two should not be exposed to screen-based technologies because of the fact that their brain develops in a different way than, than children who are actively engaged in the physical environment. And I guess this generation is looking for the next startup entrepreneur, looking at how, you know, if the child has the right art classes, they will someday be a star in the creative economy. But I think all of us know that engaging with the physical environment is a rich platform for learning. And Frank Wilson, who was a neurologist and author of The Hand, said, pointed out that when the brain took its big evolutionary leap in size and development was the moment when the opposable thumb evolved into creatures. So it's this sense that the hand is informing the brain and the brain is growing and learning from the hand. And this is very much at the heart of what we call critical making, that all of the senses are working together to embody knowledge in us as human beings. There's a wonderful project in the playground, which I hope you'll take some time to see by Cass Holman, who's a faculty member at RISD, called Rigamajig. And Rigamajig is a large-scale building kit that's conceived for hands-on free play and learning, which is a collection of wooden planks, wheels, pulleys, nuts, bolts, and ropes that allow children to really follow their curiosity through play. And if you look at this picture and think about the kind of learning we've been hearing about in this conference, the kind of competencies that are, that are the necessary competencies to succeed in the future of the economy and future jobs. People talk about curiosity, creativity, cooperation, 
collaboration, understanding the self in response to others, understanding how a community networks out from, from you know, an individual. All of these are the kind of cognitive skills that one can imagine children learning in a play environment such as this. There was a recent article in American Craft Magazine called Busy Hands, Busy Brains, and it was an interview by Joyce Lovelace with Professor Ruth Bernstein from the University of Michigan. And together with his wife, um, Michelle Ruth Bernstein, they wrote a book called Sparks of Genius, The 13 Thinking Tools of the World's Most Creative People. And they did research on scientists, looking specifically at what was the difference between scientists who achieved and scientists who excelled. So they studied all the Nobel laureate scientists and found that almost without a, a, a fault, every single one of them had engaged as they were growing up in a di distinct art or music practice. And when talking about how they made their scientific discoveries or how their mind evolved, there were huge correlations that they pointed out that helped them to do science better. And so I just want to read this one quote. Craft skills, he notes, are particularly relevant to scientific practice. The fine motor control required to perform surgery or pull a DNA strand in the lab, the keen eye that observes minute differences, the imaginative thinking and problem-solving abilities that come from a deep understanding of material and knowing how to build something from scratch. So that's kind of an underpinning for the point that I'm trying to make here about the impact of critical making. Another way that I want to talk about making is as a form of literacy. There are many languages that come out of making, and I'm using making in the broadest sense of the word. So it's not just about craft making, but it's about taking an idea, developing that idea, and making it into a tangible outcome using all the references of the senses and embodied learning. And one of the nice things about literacy is that it's a way of sharing languages. So this is a sort of literal um, product by some students at the Royal College of Art called Bedtime Stories, where they literally share their stories um, in, in their bed coverings. And it's sort of a play on words about the notion of bedtime stories. But it's very interesting to think about how making manifests in different forms of literacy. And I can say that having done work all over the world, I had, I've, I've done a lot of work with designers from different countries where our language is not common. And drawing becomes this incredible tool for ex explaining ideas. And you, one can get people who speak all different languages, but the language of drawing is a great translation and it's a great bridge for people to understand. So drawing itself is a form of language. And so in this sense, making can become a translation process that converts ideas into aesthetic experiences. And I'll just mention this book, The Art of Critical Making, co-edited by Mara Amanamar. Can you stand? She's in the front row here today, too. And, <laughs> and what this book, um, the, the reason that we created this book was to really try and articulate what it is about the curriculum in places like the Rhode Island School of Design that actually makes these nimble learners who are able to take on big challenges. And we go through the curriculum intending not just to define this for potential art students or even their parents, but also for businesses that are interested in looking at how to put more creativity into their workplace, or for people that want to understand, educators who want to understand the importance of putting art and design in K through 12 education not as a separate thing or as an add-on, but as an integral part of learning because it's such an effective way for children to learn about creativity and problem solving. In the book, we go through the basic precepts of our curriculum, and, but there are some key themes that I think are important to uh, bring out here, which talk about um, CEOs in 2010. There was a big um, interview with CEOs talking about what is the number one competency that they're looking for in hiring. And I'm sure you'll hear this throughout the conference because I've heard it talked about in several sessions. And the overwhelming idea was creativity. But there are some other forms. Creativity is a very broad word, but there are some other forms of learning that are really important. And artists and designers or people who make things and experiment and take a, an idea and turn it into something tangible know how to come up against uncertainty and walk through it. And that's a competency that when jobs are changing every 4.4 years now, people are changing jobs. And we're educating students right now for jobs that don't even exist yet. 
This idea of being nimble thinkers who can face uncertainty and thrive in that environment is more and more important than ever. This is an interesting project um, by architect Hideyoki Nakayama, who was a protege of Toyo Ito. And it's a, in conjunction with Design Tide Tokyo, teaming up with Union, a manufacturer of door handles and levers to create a glass doorknob. And as you approach the doorknob, you catch a glimpse of what appears to be another world waiting for you to enter and join, but in fact is a reflection of the room on the other side of the door. So this is this kind of translation of literacies where you're creating an experience through the design and fabrication of an object. Coding is also a language where instead of making a thing, one makes a process. And I'm going to show you an example of a process where the computer scientist actually programmed an algorithm to actually make the machine do the drawing. So he created a formula that included 37,000 lines in each frame and morphed one frame into another, but he had no idea what the computer was going to draw. So the computer was continually surprising the computer scientist, and this is just a small fragment of it. So each one of these frames contains a formula that has a lot of randomness in it and can conform in different ways. A similar project, Johan Jan creates letters as individual pieces of software, thinking beyond topography's traditional limits and expressing an implied internal structure. So it's another way for us to understand the structure of topography. At RISD, we have this wonderful jacquard loom, and this is another way that I think literacy is translated. This is the same kind of machine that one would find on a factory floor. So the students are making CAD pro programs with which to program the making of a textile. However, what's different in the way that we use it is we run the machine at one quarter speed so that all along the way, the designer can stop and intervene and actually go into sort of a pas de deux with the computer and make changes and alterations as the, as the fabric or the textile is being developed and then translate that knowledge when they become designers so that they can take that sort of intuitive cl closeness with the fabrication process into industry. And this is an example of um, Chase Taylor's textile done on that jacquard loom. And, and I would dare to say that this is actually another kind of drawing, a three-dimensional drawing using textile materials instead of charcoal or pencil. A third form of making is making as a tool of developmental thinking. And in developmental thinking, we're talking about refining ideas. We're talking about iteration. Iteration and making are not distinct processes. They are a combination. They're a mapping of a thinking process that is successfully chaotic rather than linear. And it's a way to make ideas better. So this is an example of a student's work table while she was designing some lighting. Um, and these are examples of the sort of chaotic nature of model making and drawing and working with real materials and looking at how each step in this process informs the other. These are some just very fast models that were spewed out in paper to look at all the different ways that one could approach a specific problem in a very fast kind of a uh, 15 second uh, fabrication process where the idea was to get out as many ideas as possible. And after a point of time working this way, the hand begins to have knowledge that may not be completely defined by the intellect and things start to work together and ideas really evolve. These are some more um, uh, particular models for a design process by Asher Dunn who was recently named as one of the Forbes 30 under 30. And these are examples of something he would use in his own studio to refine the manufacturing process or to talk to a client about a new direction. And then these are examples of the same models made into real objects. This is the work of Lucas Schur, who was, uh, started this as a Kickstarter project. This is called Link Mount, and he's making a series of iPhone accessories. And the Kickstarter campaign received more than $200,000 of investment and now he's actually successfully manufacturing those. But 
what you can see in this display that he's created is all the iterative forms of working with real materials, real models, making slight adjustments, testing them with the equipment. It's a prototyping method, but it shows the benefit of this long process of iterative thinking. And we can also look at other forms of translation. So this, this student, Chris Taylor, was fascinated by the way that ducks propelled themselves through waters and looked very carefully at the folding and unfolding of their feet and had the idea, what if you created a folding chair, a new kind of folding chair that rather than folding up as we know it, folded from side to side using the same kind of motion that the duck uses to propel themselves through water. And in the process, created a whole new type of folding chair. Or this work by Yoon Sun Koo, who studied the um, articulated joints of the praying mantis and was fascinated by the fact that the praying mantis can move its joint in multiple directions from the same joint and mirrored that in the design of this lamp, which does the same thing. You can move all the parts of it in any direction and it holds its memory once it finds its location. So again, this is another kind of translation where you're using making to look at systems and structures that exist in nature or in other kinds of um, uh, contexts and bring those into the realm of new ideas. This is work, it's called Knit Glass by um, a student, Jacqueline Landon. And what Jacqueline did was looked at the um, microscope, looked at the electron microscope to study cell images, and then she translated that into a knit material that was in, in encased in a kind of acetate um, backing, which became a flexible fabric or building structure that could be used as a room divider or in other kinds of contexts. So it's taking the structure that's inherent in, in cells and moving that into a three-dimensional object. Materials play a big role in this notion of critical making and of how we understand the world. And having evaluated portfolios uh, for graduate students for decades, I can tell you that I can always pick out the portfolios where someone has never had the actual experience of making the thing that they're designing. There's just, a, a, there's, there's information missing in some of the computer rendered designs which might look very beautiful, but, but actually defy the properties of the materials they're designed in, or actually couldn't function in terms of the structure because there isn't this inherent understanding of the way materials work. But one of the other things that I find really fascinating is how students and young designers and, uh, and others are looking at making new kinds of composites to give materials multiple characteristics, to take a material and give it a completely new context or a new way of behaving. This is a, a show that was curated by Diana Wagner, who's in the image there, for our materials resource room in the library, where it was an exhibit of all student-made materials. So they were new materials or new combinations of materials that the students invented or designed. And with that inquiry comes the sense of, okay, what could this do that hasn't been done before in this way? This is just an example of our materials resource center in the library. And we feel it's extremely important when people are specifying ideas that they actually can touch and feel and smell and intervene with the materials so that they really understand the potential of how their idea and how the material can support one another. And these are some experimental ideas um, using materials. The first one is, um, uh, a zippered pillow, so it's taking bubble wrap and casting it inside of silicon rubber with zippers, so it's cast as a flat sheet. And it could be something that was shipped flat. It's, you know, it doesn't take up the volume of a pillow. And then when you want to use it, you zip it together, and the combination of air and cushion and rubber makes this really wonderful experience for the, for the user um, with this unexpected uh, recipe of materials working together. And the other sho the shoes by Ian Horowitz, the loofah shoes, are made out of Egyptian loofah. And these just happened to be my size, so I got to walk around in them. And I can tell you, it was a wonderful experience. It was like walking through sand, very light, delicate sand. But the process here was to make sustainable footwear that was made entirely of vegetable fiber. And again, it's taking the, the what if, looking at a material, looking at an idea, and saying what if, and how can I bring these things together? And this is another kind of critical making. 
This is an object that I found really fascinating. I was looking at um, the kind of recipes for 3D printing on the web, because I'm thinking a lot about the difference between the kind of making that happens through a recipe, which is often the case with a lot of 3D printing, and the kind of making that emanates from deep sort of rigorous research with materials in a sort of studio-based um, approach. And I thought this was a really ironic object because you print the loom to make the fabric, but you could also just print the fabric. And so it became this interesting question about how things are made and why they're made and what the decisions are made and what the categories of making are. And this is a, another thing that you can print off of the web with a 3D printer called Palm Lamp by Johnny Katanen. And it comes in a variety of sizes and it gives the, the maker the sense that they're actually making something. But again, it is this sort of recipe form of making so that if you wanted to then find a way to design something that was slightly different or a different scale or had a different purpose, you wouldn't take away from the making of this the same things that would allow you to iterate new ideas of your own. And I kind of um, refer this as the Easy Bake Oven style of making. Now, I will admit that when I was young and I got an Easy Bake Oven, I thought it was about the best toy in the world. I was so excited when those first cupcakes came out. I was a baker. So there is this sense that you're actually making something and that inherent need that we all have to make is so much a part of who we are. But the idea of making through a recipe or actually understanding the chemistry or the subtlety of making when you're actually putting the ingredients together yourself is very different. And my proposition here is that if we're really going to think about helping to educate nimble, creative, versatile thinkers for the future, this recipe model has great limitations. And the idea of really working in a critical way where you're combining theory and context and concept and physical making together creates a different kind of outcome. There are wonderful applications of 3D printing. And I think in the area of prosthetics, for example, there are things that are just brilliant in the sense that you can program into a program based on the growth of a child, the next size prosthetic that that child will need as the bones continue to grow and have that prosthetic ready for the child. So that rather than starting from scratch, there's this way of, of, of mirroring the need of the child and the technology. And I think these are really wonderful applications. I also want to talk about making as an outcome of disciplinary expertise. And I think it, in terms of cognition and the idea of the importance of making, there are two different ways that I'd like you to think about this. One is personal development, how we evolve, how we grow individually, how we develop ourselves, and also the idea of cultural commitment. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. But in the notion of disciplinary expertise, we're really raising the bar high. We're really trying to achieve something high. And again, I don't want you to view this in terms of the outcome of the object. or It's not so much only about craft, but it's about the idea of how we develop our own standards of rigor, our own expectations for what we do. There's a very famous book that um, a lot of artists and designers have read called The Nature and Art of Workmanship by David Pye, who was kind of the guru first writing about how, why workmanship and why making is so important. And he says, workmanship is the application of technique to making by the exercise of care, judgment, and dexterity. And again, if you translate those, now this book was written, in, I think, in the 60s, but if you translate those to the kind of competencies that we're understanding are what st students and people starting in the workforce will need now, those characteristics are really important. And again, not necessarily in the configuration of an object, but in the idea of development and facing a, a challenge. This is an example of David Pye's work. This is all hand carved, so the little coves are descending inside. And this is an incredibly masterful and very difficult thing to do. This would have taken weeks of very careful carving. And at the same time, this is a project by a student, Scott Bailey, who was using the CNC router, but he hacked the router in a way that he set the resolution a little off and changed the toolpath so that the tool would work wrong. 
And in making the tool work wrong, he was able to develop a very similar kind of motif, and this one that could be carved in a couple of hours rather than a couple of weeks. And it may feel a little different than the exquisitely carved work of David Pye, but it's another kind of language in translating uh, a form through modern tools. And um, in this case, the tool path, which would usually be sanded off, was left as the effect of the, the lighting. This is an example of a house that we recently designed as um, a, a collaboration for the Solar Decathlon, the International Solar Decathlon. And it was a collaboration between Brown University, Rhode Island School of Design, and a school in Erfurt, Germany. And the name of the house is the Textile House, spelled T-E-C-H. But it's made out of a textile shell that has a very organic shape. And the big um, leap forward here was that the organic shape was set up so that flexible solar cells could be embedded on the outside of the roof. And because of the organic shape of the, of the structure, it could be capturing maximum sun throughout the day without having to move. So it was a really ingenious system. But part of what makes this house so lovely to be in is this use of textiles as a sort of invented material, but also there's a frieze that runs around just above at the sofa area that's knitted um, on an industrial knitting machine. And that knitted freeze across the room gives this incredible sense of intimacy to what is a vacuous sort of space and also a beautiful texture and pattern that makes it very livable. This is another view of inside the house. And this kind of making really could not have happened without a great understanding of structures and materials that came from many, many months of hands-on experimentation. Also, it's interesting to take making techniques from one sort of discipline and apply them to another. So this is the work of Matthias Plesning, who studied boat building and actually built a few boats and then adapted the techniques of boat building to create these beautiful benches. And in his version, they're intended to cradle the body and to actually direct in a way the way that people interact and talk to each other, using these same techniques but translating them into another kind of arena. I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of my own work. My work spans a lot from um, one-of-a-kind work, as I said earlier, to production work, but I'm going to show you a couple of pieces, and just in the context of this talk, to say that this is a bed and a, um, a hanging um, sideboard that were in an exhibit of, that I had in New York, that for me, a lot of the, 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 the interest in doing this work is to see something that I haven't been able to see before, to understand what something will look like and how materials can actually help create that vision for me. But it's also this sense of personal development, of really trying something that's incredibly challenging and that takes a long duration of commitment to achieve. This is a chest of drawers where the top drawer has these little hidden compartments and other drawers built into them. And the material here is actually all the same wood. The dark and the light are the same wood. But I experimented with doing some bleaching and varnishing things to the wood that in the white areas turned it into an effect that looks just like tortoise shell. And that sort of effect would have never happened had I not just done lots and lots of experimenting in the studio to make this um, object. And these are coffee tables that were um, designed for a big corporate space. And in this instance, I was trying to animate the space, animate what was a, a somewhat sterile space with a sense that at night, perhaps, you know, the tables would creep around the room and you'd find them differently. But it really came from an understanding of the structure and the materials that would actually have an impact on that space. And then a, a, a more sort of personal piece where um, the table and, and vase, but on the table, I actually was trying to create the effect of drawing directly onto the piece. So, the wood has linen um, thread that's wrapped around it, and then I build up these different layers of surfaces and then partially sanded through somewhat like the traditional lacquer techniques to reveal this sort of pattern which almost looks like a print, but it's actually a, you know, physically Im embedded into the material. And I show you these pieces not so much to talk about my own work, really, but to talk about how um, that work has translated into skills that I've actually been able to apply to leadership or to teaching or to writing or to lecturing. So it's those obstacles that I faced in the studio and that sort of sense of commitment to really get intimate understanding with a form or a material or a process and take it to the maximum that I possibly could 
And those, those competencies have actually really informed me in my work as a president of college. I think that that need for making is embedded in our DNA and perhaps in the natural world as well. I don't know how many of you, if you're fly fishermen, you know about the caddis fly larva, but the caddis fly larva, which is a very good fly for fly fishing, builds its own little cocoon to protect itself using sticks and pebbles. And an artist, a French artist named Hubert Duprat, thought, what about giving the caddis fly larva other materials? So he supplied them with gold flakes and opal and turquoise and rubies and pearls, and they made this incredible jewelry using the same techniques but different materials than they would typically make in the natural world. And I have a little um, quick video here that you can see that how they're building this jewelry. I'll speed this up a little so you can sort of see it as it gets. But I find this so fascinating, this notion of making that exists throughout the natural world and this, this need to make. Here, it's, it's for survival, but when the materials change, it becomes something entirely different that derives from a natural tendency. And the last area that I'd like to talk about is making as a networked identity. So this notion of a series of connections that come out of making, communities of practice, and the idea of scaling ideas, so that when you're looking at um, scaling things, there, on the one hand, you can say that someone makes a prototype and that um, when it's scaled up, it, it introduces questions like cost and material supply and sustainability and construction time and material limitations and the lifespan of an object or the environmental impact. But there are also other ways that scaling um, matters, and I think it has to do with impact. How do we learn about making? We learn, a lot of us, from our grandparents or in certain communities from elders who teach younger people how to make. But with those patterns of instruction come deep cultural assumptions. And I use these images to show that in, in many instances, making is very gendered. And you can see by you know, the grandmother teaching the little girl to sew and the grandfather teaching the little boy how to make a sailboat, that there are assumptions built into this that, that carry forward the beliefs of, generation, of earlier generations and need updating, um, or you know, in my opinion, need updating as we move forward as a culture. This is an example of um, guy gear. This is a kit for little boys to make friendship bracelets, but you know, they're cool, they're guy gear, they have big buckles, they have bold colors. You know, the, as if a little boy couldn't figure out uh, his way to make a friendship bracelet using a generic kit, but it has to be a boy kit or a girl kit. And oddly, in the toy world, play is being even more gendered than it used to be in the past, which is surprising to me because society has changed and moved on, but there's still this sense of gendered toys that um, is very apparent in the toy industry, except in a few really interesting um, examples. There's also this sense of community making, and, and one of the things about network making is this notion of cooperation and collaboration. So this is a glass pour outside the glass um, department where there's a furnace going and there are a number of people that are working together under this very tight time frame to work and, and make one experience together but also to produce objects. And then um, there is the work that really expresses cultures and cultural history. So this is the work of one of the premier national living treasure uh, metal workers in Korea. And he makes these unbelievable metal hardware pieces that adorn these beautiful traditional chests. And he's working from the techniques of his ancestry and moving them forward, but he's adding his own perspective to advance those so that that is a continuum as it moves into the future. And this is an example in his studio of some of the thinking he did to test out different ideas, to make drawings, to try the placement on the chest, to look at different techniques and different uh, configurations of each part of the hardware so that he could determine how to put his own mark on what is a continu an ancestral continuum. 
I think this notion of making is why the DIY movement has taken off so readily, because there is this inherent need to understand and express ourselves through making. And there are maker camps all over the country now, all over the world. There are maker fairs that are for children, also for adults. And you can see in this chart, just in an eight-year growth period from 2006 to 2013, the number of these fairs and how much of an interest there is in expressing this notion of people wanting to engage in making. But again, I would just venture that there is that wonderful experience of making, but there is also this much more intuitive and rich development when you combine the rigorous notion of critical making. This is an example of uh, an artist designer, um, Taylor Colantonio, who found a factory in Fall River, Massachusetts that made braided rugs, and their own practice was really um, going down. You know, they did, they, their orders were limiting, and they were concerned that the factory might go out of business. So he worked with uh, factory workers to come up with new kinds of outcomes for the processes that they used. And in the process, he made these beautiful coil pots. They're about this big. And part of what was so exciting about this were the objects themselves were really wonderful. And he also introduced different color combinations that they had thought about. But the idea of pride, that the factory workers felt that they could take this skill that they were so good at and see it in a new context or understand how to apply their years of experience into something new reinvigorated the factory itself. This is another example from the same project, Tall Vases. These are about six feet tall. And you can see the patterns of the traditional braided rugs translated into a new context. And talking about scale, there's um, an example, Rich, Brilliant, and Willing, another um, group of young designers that's been very highly publicized. And um, these are some projects that they did for IKEA, understanding that all of the work that they do comes from making their, their ideas together in a collaborative way in their studio first and then projecting them into a form that can be mass produced. And this is a picture of Alex and Theo and Charles in their studio. They've evolved their practice into very high-end lighting, as you can see on the chandelier at the top and the floor lamp on the um, side. And this is a picture of them in their studio actually testing out a new design. They're very hands-on with all of their designing. They make everything first or assemble it from parts that they order in the studio because they feel that that way they can truly understand how the object will exist beyond their studio. And another example of scale is um, Airbnb, and I know probably everyone, maybe some of you are using it while you're here during this conference, but this is an app that has really disrupted an entire industry and has millions of users. And the um, originators were um, Brian Chesky and Joe Gabbia. They're seated here with their third partner, Nathan. The two standing were RISD design alums, and um, they've been interviewed quite a lot about where they got the knowledge of how to start this company and disrupt an entire industry. And what they continued to say is it was their skills in an immersive design-making environment that gave them the ability to actually weather through the process of creating this new disruptive entity. And what uh, you, maybe you've heard the story. They had an apartment. They couldn't pay their rent. They, there was a uh, political convention in San Francisco where they lived. They were roommates. And they, one of them said to the other, you know, we have this extra air mattress in the closet. Maybe we could put it in the living room and rent it out. And that's how air, the name Airbnb started. They're actually still living in that same apartment um, now, even though Forbes just named them as one of the thousand billionaires in the country. And this is in an eight-year period. But what's really interesting to me is not so much that they could conceive of a problem and then figure out how to solve it. But if you look at how this how this company has evolved, over a million listings, 25 million guests, including um, 600 castles, I might add, in 34,000 cities. What I find really interesting is that that notion of, of critical making and of putting critical thinking and creativity and problem solving together has helped them weather a number of huge challenges at every level where their industry has had to scale up. And again, it's that design education, it's that critical making education that has allowed them to face every problem and say, hey, we can solve this. We can figure this out. And if we don't know how to do it, we'll find someone that can help us do it. Another project um, that is about scale is Waterwalla, 
which is um, a constructed social system. So this is a project that's about the design of key services and interactions, like a campaign to get people to realize the connection between water, illness, and the overall health and productivity of the entire community. It's about recognizing that this problem is bigger than a design problem and fostering cross-disciplinary work, but doing it from a creative standpoint. And what Waterwala does in areas like India and Southeast Asia with really big health problems that come from water is they research specific slum communities, they find technologies that work within those environments, they work with purifier manufacturers to lower price points, and then they engage local micro-entrepreneurs to actually sell and sell the, the products. But the big thing that they're adding to is, is they're adding an education component which helps the citizens to collect, to, I'm sorry, to connect clean water to good health. So again, this is the design of a whole social system that came out of the same kind of education. This is a, um, a woman in um, the Aboriginal outback in Australia, and I um, was watching her work when I was there as, uh, doing a project, and I was so struck by the fact, comparing her studio to my studio, my studio is full of tools, full of equipment. I have assistants who work there. It's a kind of a biz, you know, it's a big scale, small scale business. But she sat there and used this coat hanger, heated it in the fire, and then carved these panels um, just using different parts of the curve of the coat hanger to make these extraordinary patterns. So part of it is the interest that I had in seeing the difference between her way of making and my way of making, but part of it is also what she's making. These are descriptors of the whole um, belief system of her community, and they relate back to the, uh, the dreams that unite them with their ancestors and with the world that they live in. So it's kind of a, a, another form of literacy in that it's engaging a story that carries forward their cultural beliefs into the future. And you can see an example of one of her extraordinary finished works here. These are some, um, some of you may be familiar with the uh, uh, coffin makers in Ghana, but there is a tradition there that, it, and it's a very highly regarded tradition that if you want to honor someone, you bury them in something that describes what they did in their life. And this is a way of honoring them. So they commission these ex extraordinary caskets for someone who was a piano player or perhaps a pilot and it's very odd for us to think about someone making these and burying these, but this is you know, the, the form of the highest kind of homage to someone. This person probably ran a convenience store you know, that sold sodas. And you, know, you can imagine what the different um, lives and, and work of these different individuals were, from chicken farmers to fishermen. These are the guys in the back who actually were carving and painting these, these incredible objects. And you know, it's hard for us to think of being buried in a hammer or a hand plane or maybe a car, but you can imagine how this notion connects to something that is truly cultural and expresses the, the belief system of a culture and that it's expressed beautifully through making. And then there's Ai Weiwei, the famous um, Chinese artist who made this kind of a protest piece where he was taking a stance on the fact that so much of China was being destroyed, so much of the history of the beautiful temples and furnishings of China were being destroyed and replaced by Western uh, equivalents in a very um, insensitive way. So he took this part of a temple and this old traditional Chinese piece of furniture and imploded one upon the other to make a statement about this problem that he was seeing, and he you know, expressed this through making. And then there's also the fine arts, which I use as another kind of making because of their impact. So looking at the work, for example, of Julie Mertu and her incredible canvases that so many people have seen and been transformed by is another kind of expression of making. Or Richard Serra's, um, this is a study that Richard Serra did in the 70s, and this is a steel piece that totally um, challenges our notions about structure, about materials, about tension, about weight, all the assumptions that we have about structures. And these are the kind of challenges that the kids who are playing with rigamajig are learning as they're playing with those, those tools. Isimiyaki, the fashion designer, asked the design collective Nendo in Japan to make furniture out of the pleated paper that he produced in mass amounts during the process of making his pleated fabric. 
and usually it was abandoned as an unwanted byproduct. So we asked them to take a look at this and say, could you do something with this? And so their solution transformed a small pleated roll of paper into a chair that you could sort of unfold and um, make into a seat. And as they evolved the idea, they added resins to the original paper production so that it would have strength and the ability to remember its form. But the pleats themselves that were in the material gave this elasticity and springiness that made it a lovely chair to sit in. So that the general effect is a very comfortable seating experience. And in this installation at a gallery, um, Friedman Bend in New York, they created an environment where they tried to get the whole environment to read very much the way they wanted the experience of the chairs to feel. And I'll finish with this last image because I want to have time for questions or conversation. This is a project by Yayo Kasuma, which is called Infinity Mirrored Room. And this was in, um, it's called, and then the subtitle is Filled with the Brilliance of Life. And this, was, this is on display now, I think, in the temporary Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi. And it's this big room that you walk into, and it has this very interesting geometry of mirrors and lights. But as you walk in, there are other people in there, and together you feel like you're making this work of art. You have this very um, kind of out-of-body experience, in a way, of seeing how your movement and the movement of those around you influences and creates this environment. And so, in a way, you're literally making your own extraordinary life, and one that, ex ex that expresses the brilliance that's inferred in the title and creates an environment that suggestively mirrors the imagination. Um, so, I will um, close there and thank you and um, invite some questions. We'll leave this on. So I think there's a mic if anyone wants to come up and ask questions. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Jill Barche. I'm an education journalist at the Heckinger Report. Mm -hmm. But speaking more as a Brooklyn mom right now, um, <laughs> I think we have more maker fairs than Starbucks <laughs> in our borough. And I'm curious your thoughts on like the two or three things that these maker fairs are consistently doing wrong in terms of using them as a vehicle for educating kids. And what are some small things that we're having all these maker fairs everywhere? I and mean, what, what could we be doing a little bit better, for, especially for younger children? Sure. No, it's a great question. And I can't really um, assume that I know how every maker fair is working. But I, again, I think it's this notion of making from a recipe and making from something where the children can actually have an open-ended engagement that they bring themselves to, because that's going to be a much more broad range development than saying, here, make this and do it this way. And there are maker fairs that are very open and actually do engage children with giving them materials, giving them some ideas about how you can make some connections or how a material works, and then turning them loose. But there are other maker fairs where there are you know, machines running and you can come up and make a lanyard or you can, you know, you can make a little um, cut thing that has your name in it or something. Again, it both give the, the children the experience of making, but the former gives the children an expansive idea about how they can individually bring themselves into the process of making, and in, I think it's a much more enhanced form of learning. Well, again, I think that the maker fairs, you know, run a gamut, so it's not as if they're all the same, but I would encourage that idea of giving children some skills, showing them how to use some tools, giving them materials, and then asking them what they want to make. I've worked with a lot of children just um, for kind of community service work, asking them to um, make things. And, you know, the, many of them say, what am I supposed to do? You know, tell me what to do. Show me how to do it. And um, you know, my response has always been to just give them a little bit of information and then ask them some questions and say, you know, what do you think about when, what, do, what would you like to see in your room that you don't have? Or you know, what is something that really makes you laugh and let's make something that you know, would make that thing even funnier? Or you know, throw out a challenge so that instantly they're engaged in their own thinking process rather than in looking at the outcome of a product. It's really about the process that we're trying to teach kids much more than giving them the satisfaction of, you know, the easy bake oven cupcakes. Yes. 
Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I really like the word of the use critical, but I don't think the word critical can stop with just the making. Um, I mean, people in the future will have to be nimble, creative thinkers, and change jobs, but the downside of that is the political. They will be precarious working, maybe no health insurance. So my question is, can't we put the notion of criticality, criticality, criticality to uh, politics and political questions and apply making to solving political problems as well? Yeah, I, I love that question. Thank you for asking it because I totally agree with you and I don't want you to walk away with this talk with the, uh, with, the, with the implication that I'm talking that everyone has to be a maker. I'm really talking about a process of thinking. And interestingly, to your point, we have a brand new mayor in the city of Providence, and he has invited a panel of artists and designers to be in his advisory group. And he said, I'm not looking at the artists and designers to make beautiful graphics or campaigns. I'm looking at the artists and designers to reinvent government. I want people to come in and think about how government can operate differently. We do a lot of um, partnered projects, research projects, with companies like, um, we're doing one with Lego right now. I just saw um, the folks from Lego. We've done them with ESPN and Toshiba and Samsung and many, many companies, Target, et cetera. And in those processes, what we're really doing is talking about how the process of creative thinking and of learning to actually ask, not just to solve problems, but to reframe the questions that are the big world challenges can be um, benefit from the experience of artists and designers being part of that team. And one of the things that makes me the most gratified is to look at projects like Waterwalla, where our students are taking the notion of what they learned as designers and makers and applying that to actually solve real world problems, because it will take that kind of nimble creative thinking to actually address the problems of the future. Yes. Thank you. I was really impressed by your talk. I, I want to touch briefly on two threads that seem to run through your presentation. And one is the stance of traditional craft. If we look at metalworking or weaving fabric arts, um, any of these things that are very tool technique and time intensive. And then there's the juxtaposition of the emerging tools in the open source world, the digital tools, um, things like the processing language, which is high, highly iterative, um, Arduino, which we see as kind of a central point in the maker theme. And how do we create an environment that creates artifacts of both of these things, mm -hmm. these time intensive, not so iterative traditional techniques and the open source movement, and, and how do you teach that? Right. Well, it's a big question. I mean, it could be a long answer, but I want to explain that I'm, um, there's a lot of traditional craft that's exquisitely made that I don't think falls into the notion of what I'm calling critical making because it's sort of repetitive or reproduction work. There's a wonderful place for that. But what I'm talking about is the process of developing ideas through making. And I think, you know, the tools that you're describing, the traditional tools or the contemporary tools are all just tools. The computer is just a tool. The Arduino just, you know, methodologies using tools. The, the real issue is the way of thinking, and it's the way of approaching questions. And I believe that whether or not someone goes to an art and design school, that as children learn, if they have physical engagement where they're challenging themselves to come up with ideas and solutions for things, that will translate into a better use of the new tools. I can tell you that I've seen the difference between um, individuals who program CNC routers and you know digital fabrication who don't know about structures or making and the difference of those who have actually engaged and grown and developed and there is still a very big gap. Now I think as time goes on that gap will change but I, I think that the sort of traditional way of making and learning you know in when I was in middle school, the girls had home ec, the boys had wood shop. Now they've taken out both of those areas of the, the, the school and they're learning computer programming, which is great, you know, on one hand, because they need to know how to code. Coding is another important kind of language. But they're losing that physical um, acuity and it's really, again, as I said earlier about embodied learning, it's this notion of the fact that the hands, the mind, and the heart all work very clearly together to define a kind of series of competencies that one can apply then to all different kinds of work. Yes? Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I was wondering, um, you know, this is a great idea, the idea of critical making. 
How do you see it applying to those universities, though, that you know, aren't necessarily art and design universities, so might not really think that critical making is important to them? So how would a university maybe implement that into their student engagement or mm -hmm. other areas? Yeah, I think if you give you know, the students the ability, even just working in paper or working you know, with found objects or any kind of material, that the idea of actually transforming something, giving them the question of coming up with an idea and then iterating it through a series of sequences, that's where the development is happening. And it's better informed if you, if you have skills, but even if you're not trained in those skills, you can apply your own creative problem solving to this notion of taking an idea and not just developing it from here to there, but critiquing that idea and saying, well, what if it did this? And what if it did that? And what if it did that? And you can do that in writing. You can do that in you know, many forms of creative work. You can certainly, scientists are doing it all the time. And, um, but the notion is to have expectations for people to go beyond the expression of an idea with a known outcome and giving them the challenge of actually rethinking the question and then doing lots of different versions of how you get to a new solution based on your own creative question. I don't know if that answers it, but I do think that a lot of the principles, you know, in the, when we wrote the book, we were hoping that we know that not everyone's interested in going to art and design school, and although I wouldn't, I don't know why, but, um, you know, at RISD we also have very strong liberal arts, and it's this sense of this, this um, idea of bringing the context and critical theory pieces together with the studio practice that we think makes these incredible creative agents that are going to change the world, and our alumni are doing that every day, but, the, you know, the same kind of principles can be applied to other kinds of learning environments if you kind of go through that notion of framing the question, developing and drawing and iterating and then critiquing and doing this kind of feedback loop to continually spin the idea into a stronger and stronger outcome. Yes? I, this may be a similar question, but it, it's something I haven't really heard discussed. I grew up um, having these wonderful maker experiences you're talking about, building models, uh, working with Legos, linking logs, taking things apart, sometimes putting them back together again, <laughs> and sometimes they even worked. And I worked, I, I've worked as an artist and a, a teacher, and currently I work in information technology and in distance learning and in app development, and so much of what I do is digital, I really struggle with that because I don't get that tangible sense. I'm working with my hands, but I'm typing on a keyboard or I'm moving a mouse. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same to me as building something with my hands. Mentally, I can spatially imagine things, mm -hmm. but I'm really struggling making that transition from the, the tangible to the digital. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you had some suggestions on, on how to kind of bridge that gap. Well, I will tell you that at RISD, um, all of the students in the workshops have computers on their benches, and they're working very facilely back and forth between the, the kind of two modes, and you know, the computers are getting very dusty in, in the process. But um, it, I think that uh, understanding that there are different, different moments in the development of an idea when it actually is very beneficial to step away from one form of output and try something else because other things click in and then go back to the, the form of output. So it might just be that expanding what you're considering, what you're, you know, the input mechanisms and doing something that's a little bit outside, even just drawing physically, the notion of drawing. And I used to tell my students that when you draw at scale, when you stand up and draw something on a whole wall and your body gets into the action of drawing, you draw differently than when you're drawing something in a sketchbook like this because all of a sudden there's a physicality to it. So I think figuring out a way for yourself that you can sort of bring that physicality or that manipulation into it and then go back to the computing will help you to see things that you might not have seen if you had just stayed within one mode. There's some really interesting questions on the horizon about the notion of um, digital learning and studio work. And there are a lot of people doing work in that. We're doing some at RISD as well because the notion of an immersive studio environment is a really successful model of education, and we're looking at can that be translated into an online experience, and we're finding places where it can and can't, but um, I think we're uh, in a really interesting transition state. A lot of that will have to do with how kids are educated K through 12 before they come up into higher ed, and I am such a firm believer that kids still need to have the physical experience 
of imagine your body is growing and changing all the time, and you need some sort of anchor with the world to figure out what's constant, what you are, you know, what's the constant. And a lot of that happens through physical engagement. And um, I just hope that we don't lose that entirely, because I think it really um, creates a much more creative and active learner. OK, well, uh, uh, one more question. I think we have to, uh, OK, I think we have to end. So thank you so much.